looking at maybe pictures of your grandma and stuff and seeing like, do you really need to change your size? Like maybe you are like your ancestors and maybe, you know, the idea that we should all be a size two is kind of warped. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching our videos. If you'd like to support us some more, you can explore our homemade natural skincare products at purelytallow.com. Thank you so much for supporting my small business. Hey everybody, welcome to the Carnivore Revolution. I'm Serena and today my guest is Caitlin Weeks. You guys may know her as Grass-Fed Girl and Caitlin has healed Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lost weight, and just feels so much better having tried a low carb and a carnivore diet. So Caitlin, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Serena. I'm really so excited. It. Huh? I appreciate it. Absolutely. I appreciate you coming. I'm excited to share your story. Um, you have a, a pretty big following on Instagram and on YouTube, and I think it makes a big difference for people to like hear people's stories. And so let's start there with what made you decide to eat a meat-based diet and how you got better. Yeah, um, I'm from the South, just grew up on Southern comfort food, you know, spent a lot of time with my grandma eating biscuits, that kind of thing. And when I was older, uh, my parents took me to Weight Watchers with them. My my dad has had um, gastric bypass surgery. He had, he has arrhythmia. He has a lot of health issues, not maybe when he was really young, but when he was older, he had gastric bypass surgery. And so I had a lot of like influences or, you know, propensity towards obesity. And I loved eating, you know, with my dad and my grandma and, you know, that's his mom. And, you know, I just kind of grew up in a comfort food kind of environment. And um, we would go for, you know, to Weight Watchers for like a year or something, then we would gain all the weight back. And, you know, it, I was there even at six years old, you know, counting my cottage cheese and putting it into the um, cantaloupe. And, you know, I remember eating little like processed bars and things like that from Weight Watchers. And um, then when I was in high school, I kind of took it more on myself. And I started kind of binge dieting and um, doing more like starvation dieting, eating just Diet Coke all day and seeing how long I could go without eating. And I got into doing the elliptical for like an hour every night at the Y and um, just kind of unhealthy behaviors. And I did lose weight, of course, but then, you know, it just comes right back when you stop doing that or when you get so hungry, you just binge out on whatever you can find. And um, we didn't have a lot of junk food in my house. So then when I went to people's other people's houses or even my grandma, I would sneak all the food or I would, you know, if I was at a slumber party or something, I would just binge on all the little Debbies or whatever was there. And um, so by the end of high school, I uh, I had done a whole lot of dieting and I I had lost weight and I looked pretty good. But then I went to college and you know, it was the meal plan and I got pizza and Subway and Taco Bell. And this was all free, basically, you know, yeah. so I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and so I gained like 25 pounds my freshman year. And, uh, you know, of course, there's some late night beer and all this stuff. And and then by the end of college, I kind of I've always been kind of a yo-yo dieter and I went was up to 240 pounds by the end of college. And like, I didn't even want to walk on the stage, you know, to get my diploma. I was just like, I don't want to be, I just want to hide under this bleacher, you know? And it was kind of an aha moment of like, I don't want to do this anymore. And um, after that, I started losing weight again, but it was with Weight Watchers and it was more of a healthy, it was more of a healthy way. Like I was eating more protein. Um, I mean, it was still very low fat. Mm -hmm. At least it was kind of on me, you know, and, and I learned a little bit about like planning your meals and kind of anticipating hunger. And there was a little, there was some good lessons that you could take away from Weight Watchers if, and it, and that it was, it was more coming from me and I was doing more exercise, like intentional exercise and I was kind of on my own. So it felt like more empowering that time. And I lost like 90 pounds. So I was like 150 pounds. And then I decided I wanted to move to California because I thought everyone in the South is unhealthy. So I'm yeah. going to move to California and 
go where the healthy people are. Uh, really, that wasn't, they're not really that healthy, but I just thought they were. And so I moved to San Francisco and I found um, it was a really nice place to live by the water and did lots of, I did lots of like beta breakers and lots of runs. And um, I b- actually started to become a personal trainer because I had lost 90 pounds and I thought, well, I can help other people and um, share my story and all this. And then, uh, so I was doing the personal trainer thing. I had all these clients and I was thin and I was fit and I thought I've got it all figured out. Like, what's the big deal? I don't know why people don't like just do what I'm doing, you know, eat like super low fat. And, Uh um, I was, I tried like the five meals a day thing and I would carry like my cooler and, um, (laughs) You know, and of course, in personal training, everybody has an opinion about what to eat. And but the five meals a day thing seemed like the predominant idea, but also keeping your fat low. And then people were starting to say, you know, eat like healthy fats like avocado or something like that. And so I did I did that. And like I was really into Tatsuka Reno. I don't know if the, like the, the eat clean diet. It's like five. Mm-hmm. It was basically bodybuilding diet. Yeah. Um, she was a big bodybuilder back in the 90s and Oxygen magazine and yeah. Anyway, um, so I was into that and everything was pretty okay. I was very, very hypoglycemic though. So if I did not have a meal or a, a snack or a plan or something, I would, I would like lose it. I would start yeah. getting like mean and I would be like, almost like, almost like I was going to faint. Like it was crazy. And my husband was like, are you, I mean, when I I actually met my husband around this time when I was starting to be a personal trainer and I had moved to California and everything. And he was like, are you crazy or something? You know, like he almost like dumped me because he thought I was like nuts, you know, (laughs) but it was really just hypoglycemia, you know? I mean, this was like when we first started dating and, uh, then, uh, you know, I'd kept doing that for a while, a few more years and I was doing lots of the running. And then I started learning about, you know, how bad animals are for the environment. So I started kind of of living in California. Yes. And I cutting out more meat and cutting out more meat. And, um, and I was only eating like chicken breast anyway. So it wasn't that big of a sacrifice, but, uh, then, um, so I thought I was doing everything right. And I read that book, you know, remember skinny B I T C H. I don't know if you read that one. It was all about, uh, you know, the factory farming and all that. And so I was like, this is it, you know? So I was eating like no meat. I was running every day. I was doing weight training. I was like, just beating the crap out of myself. I was eating uh, a whole pot of coffee before I would go to work. I would had five, you know, I had 6 a.m. clients. So I'd get up at 5 a.m. to get there for 6 a.m. And then I was, I would like go home in the middle of the day and then I would come back and work at night. So it's basically like you have to work twice a day. You have to like rev yourself up for twice a day. And I was just just mainlining coffee, probably Diet Coke too. And then all of a sudden, one day, my wrist, I mean, my elbow just started. I did like some 10 pound bicep curls, like no big deal. And my elbow just went crazy. Like it didn't heal. Like it felt like my, it, it felt like, somebody had just like punched me in the elbow for like a month. And I was like, I don't understand this. Like I've always recovered well, you know? And then I started like, it seemed like everything I ate kind of gave me like a stomach ache. And I was like distended, bloated all of a sudden I never had really digested problems or anything. And then it was just like little things like that. And I started having, it feels like rashes or some, everything was like giving me rashes. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. And And then I started sleeping. Like it was like when I got home from work, I had to just sleep. I couldn't do anything except sleep. And then even when I was training people, I had to hold the wall or I had to sit on a bench. Like I could not stand up the whole time that I was training people. I was like, okay, this is weird. Cause I never had digestive problems. I never had really energy problems, really never had health problems at all. And then, uh, I went to the doctor. They said, oh, well, maybe you just need to like change your birth control or something. And I had turned 30 and they were like, you're 30 now. So you should, you know, just, just, you just need to accept it or whatever. And I was like, sleeping 18 hours a day is normal, you know, like that's insane. And then, um, 
my mom had sent me a list. She said, ask them for these tests. And I did. They wouldn't do it. So I wrote them on the sheet myself. And it was all these thyroid tests. And I took it to the lab and uh, they did the tests. And they said, of course, one of them was showing that I had Hashimoto's, which was, um, I had a friend that was actually a naturopathic doctor. So I was able to give her the tests and she could see the results. And she said, oh, you need to be on thyroid medication like right away. And I was like, oh, and within two weeks, I mean, I felt like a whole new person. Like that made the biggest difference. She put me on nature thyroid, which is in desiccated, natural desiccated thyroid. It made a huge difference, but I, I knew that wasn't the whole thing. Um, I wasn't all the way better or anything. I was just like, my energy had improved, but my digestive system was still completely crap. And <laughs> literally, and then, uh, it was just, I knew there was so much more. And around that time I had actually, I had already discovered that I was obsessed with nutrition and I had started nutrition school. And so I went to Bauman college in Berkeley, California, which is a holistic nutrition college. And they are more kind of plant-based, but during the second year, I actually learned about Weston A. Price and they were, there was an emphasis on what they called building diets. So it was like you eat more protein um, during a sickness. And so I was really gravitated towards that idea. And then I when learning about Weston A. Price, and then I actually got involved in like the Weston A. Price organization in the Bay Area is very active. And there's all these things you can go to and like, you know, you can learn how to make ginger beer and, you know, things like that. And you can go visit farms and there's tons of stuff like, especially over in the East Bay. And mm -hmm. um, so I was really immersed in that. Um, and it made a huge difference. And I, and then I, I met some paleo um, bloggers and authors, and I got really involved in that. So, you know, I kind of was going along, learning about things in, you know, my own pace, and uh, I got better, I got a lot better. And then a few years ago, uh, it's just my digestion never got better, it never really improved, but I was still eating tons and tons of vegetables, I was a little more I was more low carb. I was doing paleo, but I realized that I couldn't handle all the carbs and the honey and the sweet potatoes and these things that are, you know, coconut sugar is really big on paleo diet. And mm -hmm. um, so I cut those out and I felt better, but I was still eating tons and tons and tons of vegetables because like I was always trying to lose weight a little bit. And I thought, well, I'll just fill up on vegetables. But that was just, it was making me so bloated and um, so when I finally talked to somebody about the carnivore diet and they said to cut out vegetables, I was like, whoa, you know, and to stop worrying about like counting calories or like stop worrying so much about your portions. And that was freeing for me because even on when I was doing low carbon stuff, I was still worrying so much about how much I was eating and yeah. You know, and then when keto started, it was like, oh, only eat four ounces of protein, eat moderate protein and that kind of thing. I was just like, so you're basically still counting and measuring. Yeah. It's like, it's just like Weight Watchers, basically. Yeah. You're trying to limit your protein. And that was always really difficult for me because I have a huge appetite. Like I'm always mm -hmm. hungry. And yeah. And with carnivore, it was the first time I was actually not hungry and I felt amazing. I did it for 30 days and I was like, I'm going to stick with this. Like, as long as I can, like I, I extended I, the first 30 days I got, I didn't really see that much improvement except for the bloating, the bloating went away within like 24 hours. And then, um, but the slow digestion that was still there. Um, but then after about six months, it started getting better. So I think maybe I was having some gut healing and then, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of up to that's up to about two, three years ago. So. so where did you land? Where is your diet now? Where where do you feel happiest and where do you feel your best? Well, um, I still, I don't think that I've landed really um, because I had a baby in 2020, 20, that's right. And, uh, and I feel like my recovery kind of started all over again because mm. that was such a uh, dramatic thing. Mm. And I had a huge C-section that was un plan and definitely not what I wanted. And, uh, but you know, I'm glad that we're all alive and everything. Yeah. So, I mean, 
emergency medicine is a great thing sometimes. Right. And, uh, you know, my baby is now three and a half. And for the first two or three years, I was a nurse. I, I nursed for three years. And so um, if you don't know, that means I didn't sleep for three years. Yeah. <laughs> so um, because I didn't do like sleep training or anything. We just slept together and he nursed as much as he wanted for three years. And so mm -hmm. I still feel like um, we just stopped nursing in this August. And so I've been kind of, you know, getting more sleep since then. And it's been amazing. So I feel better. And, you know, I've tried some challenges. It feels like the only way I can, when I feel my best is like on the lion diet, mm -hmm. um, basically no dairy. But I find that it's really difficult for me to do that for more than like a month. And uh, it's just like, a, it, it, I think we don't take into account, like, there's a mental health component. And it's really difficult to do these diets, especially if you, for me, being isolated from going out to eat or things like that is very, I'm not really willing to do that, I think, because yeah. I've done that for so long, because I've been sick for so long or mm -hmm. messed up for so long. So mm -hmm. I feel like you know, there's a happy medium between like uh, following a perfect carnivore diet or a lion diet. And I mean, yes, I get the best results, but I feel, you know, like I don't, I don't feel happy, let's say, right. you know, like mm -hmm. I feel mad. So it's like, uh, I think it's hard to find the the perfect combination. Um, I do feel like the, you know, limiting dairy as much as I can does feel the best for me. And this month I'm doing a challenge where I stop all, uh, I was doing like the element, you know, mm -hmm. the sweetened, <clears throat> the flavored element and stuff. And I got really like addicted to that. And so I have done, I stopped that for the first of March and it really helped my sweet tooth. Cause that was yeah. just like, I had to have that after every meal. It's like, I was always looking for something sweet or I would go get mm -hmm. like, I go get <clears throat> tea and then I put like stevia in it or something like that. So getting off the stevia has been, it's helped my sweet tooth a lot. And so, you know, um, I mean, of course I know you're not supposed to have that in the first place, but, but, you know, when you're doing like lion diet or something and it's like a crutch, you know, yeah. kind of. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I don't mean, I've never done, ex I've done just coffee, like black coffee. That's what I do when I'm, it's my version of the lion diet to do black coffee and then the rest of the day, just meat. And, uh, that is the best, but again, it's really hard for me to stick with it. So, um, I think, and I figured out like small amounts of vegetables are not really a big problem for me, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, my digestion doesn't really, it doesn't matter either way. Like it still sucks, you know? Yes. <laughs> and yeah, my digestion went backwards when I had mm -hmm. my baby. So, you know, I'm still really in the middle of kind of figuring it out. Um, and I've, you know, now I've just when you have a baby, you all the focus goes off yourself. You know, you have to go. You you just basically worried about keeping that person alive, you know, and then when a little a few years out, you can start thinking about, OK, I'm going to, you know, maybe I'm I'm going to do like a SIBO test and I have this like mold test that I want to do. And, you know, just kind of I've been focusing on more of that the light thing, like I get outside in the morning, try yeah. to do that before I look at my phone or whatever, or so that I open all the windows when I get up, if it's not like a super cold day and I, you know, drink my coffee by standing near the window or I go outside if I can mm -hmm. and just getting outside as much as possible. You know, those are things I'm doing now. And, um, I wear my glasses after sunset, my, I can't remember the name of it, SRT or something. No, something like that. What is it? Spectrum. Yeah. Oh, okay. So your blue blockers. Yeah. The, that's the one I got. I had tried a couple of the other brands, but they didn't fit me right. And like yeah. the Spectra ones are the ones that fit my face the best to where I could just keep moving around the house. I can't, I can't just hold my glasses on, you know? <laughs> so those are the best ones I've found so far that really fit um, yeah. my face. And, but yeah, I mean, I still eat like 99%, you know, meat and eggs and you mm -hmm. know sometimes I'll to me a cheat is a little bit of cheese yeah and you know or having some cream in my coffee or making like a butter coffee that's like a cheat mm -hmm. to me but um so yeah I mean I I'm doing really good I mean I feel really good and yeah. you know one of the biggest achievements I had which you mentioned is the 
um, remission of my thyroid antibodies, which I never had that when I was doing like keto or um, paleo. I was always like around a hundred. So if you don't know your, your listeners might not know that a, most people have, when they have Hashimoto's, they have TPO antibodies or TGB antibodies. So, um, mine were TPO. Some people have both. Um, but mine were always the TPO. And when I first got sick, I had a 600 on that. And then I brought them down to about a hundred and it stayed about a hundred the whole time I was doing paleo and keto. And then when I did carnivore, uh, this past year or so, I got it down to 26, which a lot of doctors uh, think it's remission. Um, under 30, uh, the lab tests say that you're in remission from Hashimoto. So I think that's a big achievement for, and it just says that, you know, my immune system has calmed down. It's not reacting to every single thing. And so, you know, that could be, I think that's a good goal for most people who have Hashimoto's. Try to get that number down because I think it's going to indicate that you're feeling really good and that your body is not like having this cytokine storm of, you know, it's attacking itself. So, you know, that's really what you want. So how did your friends and family feel when you, or what did they say when you cut out vegetables and fruits and were like, yeah, I'm just going to eat meat. (laughs) Did they say what people say to us now? Like, man, that's crazy. You're going to get sick. You're going to die of a heart attack. What about your cholesterol? What happened with that? I think my, my family, we're all really close and they, they know that I've been struggling for so long. I don't think they were too, too worried about it. I mean, that's kind of like, you do what you want to do. You know, mm-hmm. we're not gonna try to convince you. They also just like don't want me to tell them what to do. You know, so it's like yeah. you do that, but keep it away from me. You know, um, my sister actually has done it with me a lot. She actually was the one who did it first, I think, <clears throat> and she lost a lot of weight and felt mm-hmm. better and stuff. So, um, but she's more keto now. But um, I think they knew that I had just been through so much that they were like, you know, if it makes you feel better, then great. You know, they weren't too hard on me about it. Maybe my husband kind of, <laughs> but it, again, it's like, you do it. Just don't make me do it. You know? Yeah. So that was the other thing I was going to ask. So I have uh, four children. My oldest is 23, uh, my oldest daughter. And then I have a 21 year old son and a 17 and 15 year old daughter. And um, it's like, I didn't make everybody do this with me. I mean, I I think they're all too old for me to dictate what they eat. And I don't want to drive a wedge in between us, you know, make them feel bad every time they eat something that's not a piece of meat. They're all very healthy. Um, I know that the best thing for them would be to eat mostly meat and I want them to stay healthy. So I encourage that as much as I can, but I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do that and drive that wedge between us at their ages. I want them to make the decision on their own. Um, so we are not all carnivore. My husband mostly is, I would say he's meat-based more than anything. Um, so what's it like in your house? Do you, your son and your husband eat the way you do? Um, I mean, I'd say we just kind of lead with protein with them. I mean, I, I always give my son like cheese eggs for breakfast and, um, you know, I try to get him to eat the protein first and the meat first or eggs or fish or whatever protein it is. Um, and then, you know, if he wants to eat fruit or, um, like if he wants to eat a perfect bar or something like that's not for not meat uh, later on. Um, you know, I try to keep him mostly gluten-free, but it's hard. Like if he goes to his grandma or something like that, um, but he doesn't have, my son doesn't have any allergies when he was little. He had kind of a milk thing when, when we were, when he was around one years old, he would get like splotchy skin on his um, back and stuff when he had milk or cheese or, but then it seemed like uh, I I took it out for a while and then I introduced the A2 raw milk and mm-hmm. he did really well with that for a long time and it didn't, he didn't have any rashes or anything. So I think maybe it was just an immature gut or something like that. And then, and he, he did much better with just the A2 I didn't give him other stuff for a while. And then now he can just eat whatever cheese or milk or whatever. I mean, I still buy the raw milk. It seems like lately he's not really into it. So I just stopped buying it because I was like, I'm not going to waste my money if he's not going to drink it, you know? So, um, so maybe he's just in a phase and we'll go back to it when, if he wants more, you know, later I can always get it for him. It's not hard to get 
not really hard to get here. That's awesome. It's really hard for us to get a raw dairy here. We have to, um, I think it's a, called a a share. We have to buy a share and a cow yeah. at a farm. And then basically they act like we own the cow. And yeah, you know, I did the same thing, milk. but I'm just saying there's a lot of it around. Like you can, yeah. Yeah, I'm the member of the share. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That we were, we did too. Um, but I really feel like raw milk became like a gateway drug for me oh. because it was okay for me to drink it, and it's so daggone yummy. delicious. I mean, so, yeah. I could drink like it's a like, whole gallon of it and just not even it. think twice. I'm, you know, I love it. I could drink yeah. a whole gallon in like a day. So yeah, me too. And that's what we were doing. We were going through a gallon in 24 hours, and it's ten dollars a gallon. I was like, yeah. okay, something's got to give here. So I. So we're not members right now, but we've talked recently about doing it again and like using it for specific purposes, like yeah. one cup a day or to make ice cream, you know, carnivore ice cream or something like that, like using it in things instead of just making it like we can go to the fridge and pour a cup, you know, like this big and chug it like <laughs> it's too expensive for that. I mean, That's like me and my sister with the orange juice when we were little. <laughs> Just feel like I get it. Sugar addicts, even then, right? Like, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. We would fight over the cinnamon toast crunch. My sister is seven years younger than me, but (laughs) we were always fighting over the. If we did have something sweet in the house, we would kill each other to get it. (laughs) Yeah, so funny. The addiction starts young. Okay, so you have some cookbooks, right? Let's talk about that. What kind of cookbooks do you have? Tell everybody. Well, I did a paleo cookbook a, lo- a few e- in 2014, so it's been a while. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a really beautiful. It's a Mediterranean paleo cookbook, and uh, you know, if you're just kind of new to this lifestyle, like, paleo is a great place to start and mm-hmm. it's an ancestral diet. You know, kind of before agriculture started, and yes. it's gluten free and grain free, and um, it's and it's very meat heavy book because um, I th- I think the interpretation of Mediterranean diet is totally whack. Um, it's a lot of meat. I've been my husband is from uh, North Africa on the Mediterranean Sea and they eat a ton of meat. So they slaughter animals. I mean, you name it. It's all about the meat and the animal based everything. So um, they use the whole animal and uh, they eat like sardines and all this stuff. Anyway. So that was, it's a really cool book and you can get that on Amazon, MediterraneanPaleoCooking.com. And also I have a carnivore ebook that I wrote with my sister and it's 182 pages all about how to do the carnivore diet in the right way and dealing with family and friends and special occasions and meal plans, shopping lists, all that stuff. So that's at carnivore30.info. Okay. Awesome. And so now have you had any book recommendations for people? Do you have some good books you'd like to recommend to people who want to get started? They don't know where to start, whether it's with carnivore or low carb or keto or paleo, like somebody who just wants to clean up their diet. I mean, I think, uh, there, I think you really have to change your mindset around and you have to kind of look at your why. I mean, it, to me, going to nutrition school was really transformative. Like we read the Schwartzbein Principle, which was a really old school book, but it's it's all about um, the body image, like dealing with looking at maybe pictures of your grandma and stuff and seeing like, are you really, do you really need to change your size? Like maybe you are like your ancestors. And maybe, you know, the idea that we should all be a size two is kind of warped, like looking at your bone structure and, you know, just, just questioning kind of the, the mainstream idea. And then she was also super huge on eating protein and stabilizing your blood sugar. And that book really kind of changed my life because I was like, Whoa, you know, I mean, I'm eating like granola bars all the time. Like maybe that's not a good idea, you know? And that book is like from the seventies, I think, but it was a really mind blowing book at the time. And for somebody coming off Weight Watchers, it was really good. Um, and you know, Sally Fallon and those books about nourishing traditions, I think, I mean, I really think you need to educate yourself, not just like, okay, I'm going to do carnivore and that's it. You know, the evolution for me of reading all these things and, you know, seeing what feels best for you. I mean, some people, you know, can tolerate sourdough bread and things like, um, not me, but I think knowing that that's an option is a good thing or, you know, just learning about traditional food, I think is, is a great thing. And, you know, of course you can get Maria Emmerich's book or Sean Baker's carnivore book. They both have carnivore. If you want a, um, 
you know, hardback. And then I think like Judy has a new hardback about mm -hmm. beginning carnivore, but, um, you know, it's, there's so many books you could read and, but I think, you know, just watching lots of YouTubes and just, just don't do it. Like one of my in-laws or not in-laws, but one of my sister's in-laws <laughs> said to her, like, uh, I started a carnivore diet. So I went through the, um, I went through the, the drive through and I got some of those chicken nuggets at, Ch at Chick-fil-A, the, the grilled, you know, the grilled ones, the good ones. <laughs> and then they like, yeah, I ate that. And then, um, by the end of the day, I was, I was starving so much that I gave up, you know, it's like, <laughs> okay, that's the wrong way to, to try it. You know, that's not the right approach. You know, you got to educate yourself a little more than that. And, and like I've heard so many times you have, to, once you cut out the fat, I mean, once you cut out the carbs, you have to fill in with some fat. Like you can't, especially at the beginning, maybe later you can experiment with like cutting fats or something, but at the beginning you can't just cut down to zero carbs and right. zero fat. Like you will fall flat on your face and right. be miserable. So yeah. And I think you have to play with it too. Like you can get started and then you have to kind of mess with your macros if you're counting those. And sometimes people need to, but you need to mess with it and kind of figure out what works best for you and what makes you feel your best. We're all kind of our own little science experiments, aren't we? As we're just trying to figure everything out. Um, so I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for hanging out with me today. I think your story is amazing and hopefully it'll help somebody today. Thank you, Serena. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Carnivore Revolution.